Welcome to A Star Witness. Hello everyone, this is Kayla bringing another episode. And before we get into it, let's have a word of prayer so the Lord will be with us during this podcast. So with that, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the many blessings that you've given us. Lord, we ask for your leading and guiding in our lives. Help us to have the victory over the enemy who wants to get our souls and who wants to keep us from being with you forever. Lord, we thank you for conquering the devil. We thank you for overcoming the temptations that you had to deal with in your life that made us conquerors too. We ask that you continue to lead and guide and direct us and to continue to have mercy on us and to forgive us from all of our sins. We ask all these things in your precious, holy, wonderful son's name. Amen. I want to read from the book Conqueror, and I'm going to read several sections from there, but they all kind of go really well together. But before I do that, I want to read some verses in the Bible. It says in Colossians 3, 4, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. And it says in John 17, 1 through 2, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Revelation 1, 18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image Image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. First Corinthians fifteen nineteen through twenty three. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. And Colossians 1, 12 through 15 and 18. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminent and all of these verses have this underlying theme which i'll get into in a little bit but i want to first read a little bit more second timothy 1 10 and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our savior christ jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel first peter three eighteen for christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit so we have all of these things telling us that christ conquered death christ was the one who made it possible for us to also conquer sin and so i really wanted to touch on this and kind of look at this and it shows how much it meant that Jesus came down to this earth to conquer sin and the devil. And we kind of get the inside looks of what the devil thought when Christ became a baby and what it means for us. So with that, let's go right into what she says, because all of those verses are pointing us to the fact that Christ conquered Satan and was victorious over him and the temptations that he presented him. And through that victory, we gain the victory as well. So it's a very triumphant moment and it's really great. So let's get right in. At the birth of Christ, Satan saw the plains of Bethlehem illuminated with the brilliant glory of a multitude of heavenly angels. He heard their songs, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. The prince of darkness saw the amazed shepherds filled with fear as they beheld the illuminated plains. They trembled before the exhibitions of bewildering glory, which seemed to entrance their senses. The rebel chief himself trembled at the proclamation of the angel to the shepherds. Fear not, for behold, 
I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He had met with good success in devising a plan to ruin men, and he had become bold and powerful. He had controlled the minds and bodies of men from Adam down to the first appearing of Christ. But now Satan was troubled and alarmed for his kingdom and his life. Yeah, he did not like the fact that Jesus came down here to save us from our sins. And he was going to do everything in his power in order to get Christ to sin. At least that's what his plan was. So the song of the heavenly messengers proclaiming the advent of the Savior to a fallen world and the joy expressed at this great event, Satan knew boded no good to himself. Dark forebodings were awakened in his mind as to the influence this advent to the world would have upon his kingdom. He queried if this was not the coming one who would contest his power and overthrow his kingdom. He looked upon Christ from his birth as his rival. He stirred the envy and jealousy of Herod to destroy Christ by insinuating to him that his power and his kingdom were to be given to this new king. Satan imbued Herod with the very feelings and fears that disturbed his own mind. He inspired the corrupt mind of Herod to slay all the children in Bethlehem who were two years old and under. Which plan he thought would succeed in ridding the earth of the infant king. This is so evil to kill all of those poor innocent children just because he knew what it would mean for him if Jesus were to survive past any age and succeed in his mission of saving earth so he was going to do everything in his power that he could to ruin it for Jesus to not be able to save everybody and so he filled Herod with these horrible evil thoughts and Herod enacted on them and thus many many innocent lives were lost I mean I can't even imagine the horror of that day and how the mothers must have felt having their little child ripped from their arms and be put to death and probably having to see it in front of their eyes I oh I can't even begin to understand the sadness the horror just how horrible that must have been the Lord definitely is going to have the vengeance of all of those who participated in those horrible evil acts and I'm sure the angels were there to try and bring comfort where they could but I'm sure it stayed with the people's minds for many many years it's no wonder why people didn't like Herod and no wonder why Herod feared that his kingdom was going to be uprooted by a different person because the people didn't like what they were doing and not to mention killing all of the babies but the taxes and everything else that Herod was doing he wasn't a very good ruler he was very cruel too so this is just one example of his cruelty we don't want anything to do with Herod and so that's why he had to make sure that no one had an opportunity to uproot him. She continues, But against his plan, Satan sees a higher power at work. Angels of God protected the life of the infant redeemer. Joseph was warned in a dream to flee into Egypt, that in a heathen land he might find an asylum for the world's redeemer. Satan followed him from infancy to childhood and from childhood to manhood, inventing means and ways to allure him from his allegiance to God. God and overcome him with his subtle temptations. The unsullied purity of the childhood, youth, and manhood of Christ, which Satan could not taint, annoyed him exceedingly. All his darts and arrows of temptation fell harmless before the Son of God. And when he found that all his temptations prevailed nothing in moving Christ from the steadfast integrity or in marring the spotless purity of the youthful Galilean, he was perplexed and enraged. He he looked upon this youth as an enemy that he must dread and fear. I think it's so hilarious that every plan and every situation that Satan tried to get Christ to do and all of his plans that he wanted to go so well all fell apart on him. It's hilarious because we know who the true conqueror and hero of the day is. It's not Satan. 
that's for sure. He has failed and failed and failed, and hopefully he continues to fail in each and every one of our lives. And when we put Christ in our lives and we go to Christ first, he will fail in tempting us to fall away and to go on his pathway. So this is just one of those instances where you read about and you're just chuckling because you know that Satan doesn't even stand a chance. <laughs> and that's a great feeling. She says that there should be one who walked the earth with moral power to withstand all his temptations, who resisted all his attractive bribes to allure him to sin, and over whom he could obtain no advantage to separate from God, chafed and enraged his satanic majesty, the childhood, youth, and manhood of John, who came in the spirit and power of Elijah to do a special work in preparing the way for the world's redeemer were marked with firmness and moral power. Satan could not move his integrity. When the voice of this prophet was heard in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Satan was afraid for his kingdom. He felt that the voice sounding forth in trumpet tones in the wilderness caused sinners under his control to tremble. He saw that his power over many was broken. The sinfulness of sin was revealed in such a manner that men became alarmed and and some, by repentance of their sins, found the favor of God and gained moral power to resist his temptations. He was on the ground at the time when Christ presented himself to John for baptism. He heard the majestic voice resounding through heaven and echoing through the earth like peals of thunder. He saw the lightnings flash from the cloudless heavens and heard the fearful words from Jehovah, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He saw the brightness of the Father's glory overshadowing the form of Jesus, thus pointing out in that crowd the one whom he acknowledged as his son with unmistakable assurance. The circumstances connected with this baptismal scene had aroused the most intense hatred in the breast of Satan. He knew then for a certainty that unless he could overcome Christ from thenceforth, there would be a limitation of his power. He understood that the communication from from the throne of God signified that heaven was more directly accessible to man. Hallelujah for that because this is a great scene we have here before us. We have good versus evil as always and we have good winning out like it always does and evil being so angry because good is winning as usual and he knows what this is going to bring. He knows that if Christ is successful in his mission that he will will fail and he will fall and he will be no more and that his power will be weakened and there will be a deep cut to what he wants to do and that's take the place of God which he can never do because Christ was successful in his mission and Satan dreams all crumbled to ashes as they rightfully should because we see the world and the condition that it's in because of his ruling and because that there's sin in the world. We don't want this corruption. We don't want people to hate each other to murder each other to do all of the other atrocious acts that are happening in the world none of that makes us feel safe none of that makes us want to stay where we're at where the earth is literally corroded because of all of the corruption that is taking place and it's falling apart and we have all of the earth groaning under the weight of how we as humans have treated it and that's just not a good living condition for anybody so it's a really wonderful thing Thing that Christ stepped in and was like, you know what? I'm not going to allow Satan to have full control. No, I'm going to remake this earth to something way better than it ever was before. And you never have to worry about sin ever again because all those who are coming to heaven will have passed the tests and the trials and will have overcome and gotten the victory through me because I can help you overcome sin and the temptations that Satan brings you. She can continues, as Satan had led man to sin, he had hoped that God's abhorrence of sin would forever separate him from man and break the connecting link between heaven and earth, the opening heavens and connecting
connection with the voice of God addressing his son was like a death knell to Satan. He feared that God was now to unite man more fully to himself and give power to overcome his devices. And for this purpose, Christ had come from the royal courts to the earth. Satan was well acquainted with the position of honor Christ had held in heaven. And as the son of God, the beloved of the father, and that he should leave heaven and come to this world as a man filled him with apprehension for his safety. He could not comprehend the mystery of this great sacrifice for the benefit of fallen man. He knew that the value of heaven far exceeded the anticipation and appreciation of fallen man. The most costly treasures of the world he knew would not compare with its worth as he had lost through his rebellion all the riches and pure glories of heaven. He was determined to be revenged by causing as many as he could to undervalue heaven and to place their affections upon earthly treasures. This should give us much to think about. This paragraph alone says so much and has so much weight behind it because we do not value heaven as we should. We do not even realize the glories that are waiting for us if we were to just be willing to follow Christ. And it is hard because our natures want to do what we want to do. It's not impossible. It's just a matter of are we willing to sacrifice because it's not really a sacrifice when you think of it in these terms. What are you gaining out of your sacrifice? That real thing that we should be remembering and keeping at the forefront. And it's not just the beauties and the wonders of heaven because they far outweigh anything this world has to offer. It's the pure love that Christ has for us, that he hates sin so much, yet notwithstanding, he was willing to come down to this sin-sick world and be a sacrifice for us and to live as a human lives and go through all of the suffering that he went through just so that we could be saved. And that is beyond our comprehension. His love is so wide, so deep, and that is why it will be our study throughout eternity because no matter how many years pass us by in eternity, we will always be learning of how much love he has for us. I mean, think about some of the things that we have done as human beings, some of the sins that we have committed and we think, man, I don't understand how God can forgive me. I don't understand how he could love me still. And yet he does. Time and time again, we fail and we fall and we don't even think about the things that we are doing half of the time. We just do them and we don't really care. And yet when we get that conviction in our souls and we realize what we've done and we feel how we should not be doing it and how sad it is that we have done it, and we fall on our knees and we confess our sins. God wants to forgive us. He's waiting to forgive us. He jumps at the chance to do everything in his power to get us to the point where we confess and change and do what he wants to do. Not because we're forced to, but because we love him and we want to be in heaven with him. And that is his main goal is because he loves us so much that he's like, I know what's best for you. I know what I have in store for you. You just have to trust me. It's so beautiful when we think about this on a deeper level as we should every single day. It continues, it was incomprehensible to the selfish soul of Satan that there could exist benevolence and love for the deceived race so great as to induce the prince of heaven to leave his home and come to a world marred with sin and seared with the curse. He had knowledge of the inestimable value of eternal riches that man had not. He had experienced the pure contentment, the peace, exalted holiness, and unalloyed joys of the heavenly abode. He had realized before his rebellion the satisfaction of the full approval of God. He had once a full appreciation of the glory that enshrouded the Father and knew that there was no limit to his power. <laughs> and yet, having all that knowledge, he still walked away. I just don't understand why he did what he did. And we will never have an explanation for that because I don't even think Satan himself knows why he did what he did at times. And now we're in the mess that we're in because of him. If he had just not done it, none of this would have happened. But in a way, we kind of should be grateful because now 
we have the opportunity to realize the effects of what sin can do. But it would have been far better not to have seen any of those effects. But such as it is, we are here and we have a wonderful Savior full of great power. There's no limit to his power that is waiting and wanting to save us because he loves us so much. That is an amazing love for sure. Satan knew what he had lost. He now feared that his empire over the world was to be contested, his right disputed, and his power broken. He knew through prophecy that a savior was predicted and that his kingdom would not be established in earthly triumph and with worldly honor and display. He knew that ancient prophecies foretold a kingdom to be established by the prince of heaven upon the earth, which he claimed as his dominion. This kingdom would embrace all the kingdoms of the world and then his power and his glory would cease and he would receive his retribution for the sins he had introduced into the world and for the misery he had brought upon man. He knew that everything which concerned his prosperity was pending upon his success or failure in overcoming Christ with his temptations in the wilderness. He brought to bear upon Christ every artifice and force of his powerful temptations to allure him from his allegiance. It is impossible for man to know the strength of Satan's temptations to the Son of God. Every temptation that seems so afflicting to man in his daily life, so difficult to resist and overcome, was brought to bear upon the Son of God in as much greater degree as his excellence of character was superior to that of fallen man. <laughs> that just blows my mind. We think we have it bad, but he had it 10 times, 100 times, whatever times, much more times worse than we ever have it. And it is because he went through that that we don't have to have it as bad as he had it, which we should be eternally grateful to him for that. Christ does not allow us to be tempted more than we are able to bear. So he gives us that ability to bear and to overcome. We just have to be willing to ask for help. We have to pray. We have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. I cannot do this on my own. Christ was tempted in all points like as we are. As man's representative, he stood the closest test and proving of God. He met the strongest force of Satan. His most wily temptations of Christ has tested and conquered in behalf of man. It is impossible for man to be tempted above what he is able to bear while he relies upon Jesus, the infinite conqueror. And that gives us hope. That right there should fill us with so much hope, so much faith, so much love for our Savior because he went through all of this so that we wouldn't have to. And that is so amazing. I mean, when we really think about it, deeply think about it, no love compares to Christ's love. And that is why these things should always be in our mind. We should think about them. We should realize how much much Christ actually went through to save fallen man. And he loves us so much that he would have done it just for one of us. That's how much he loves us. And that is uncomparable to any love that we know. And that love is waiting for us. We have to just accept it. We just have to go to him and say, I surrender all to you. Please, Lord, help me to be more like you. And Christ is longing for that prayer of the repentant sinner. She says this, Because man, fallen, could not overcome Satan with his human strength, Christ came from the royal courts of heaven to help him with his human and divine strength combined. Christ knew that Adam and Eden, with his superior advantages, might have withstood the temptation of Satan and conquered him. He also knew that it was not possible for man out of Eden, separated from the light and love of God since the fall, to resist the temptations of Satan in his own strength. In order to bring hope to man and save him from complete ruin, he humbled himself to take man's nature, that with his divine power combined with the human, he might reach man where he is. He obtained for the fallen sons and daughters of Adam that strength which it is is impossible for them to gain for themselves that in his name they might overcome the temptations of Satan. That 
is so awesome that he was willing to do this. And we can have that victory. We can overcome the temptations of Satan. We just have to be willing to work together with Christ because Christ is way more willing to work with us than we are sometimes to work with him because we know what it means. We It means to give up those things sometimes that we love and hold on to most dearly. But it is not impossible. With Christ, our King, working for us and with us, we can have the victory. And this is the theme throughout all the Bible, throughout all the plan of redemption and salvation, and what Christ gives us over and over and over again through many promises in the Bible is that I'm here for you. I will help you. You are not alone. I have given the victory. I will help you gain the victory. You do not have to face this enemy alone. Let me help you. I love you so much that I laid down my life for you. Let me just lead and guide. Let me be the bearer of your burden. You do not have to bear this burden alone. That is why we must tell Jesus everything. That is why we must go to him for not only our sorrows and our temptations, but our joys. The Lord wants to hear it all. She says this, The exalted Son of God in assuming humanity humanity draws himself near to man by standing as the sinner's substitute. He identifies himself with the sufferings and afflictions of men. He was tempted in all points as man is tempted, that he might know how to secure those who should be tempted. Christ overcame on the sinner's behalf. Jacob in the night vision saw earth connected with heaven by a ladder, reaching to the throne of God. He saw the angels of God clothed with garments of heavenly brightness, passing down from heaven heaven and up to heaven upon this shining ladder. The bottom of this ladder rested upon the earth, while the top of it reached to the highest heavens and rested upon the throne of Jehovah. The brightness from the throne of God beamed down upon this ladder and reflected a light of inexpressible glory upon the earth. This ladder represented Christ who had opened the communication between earth and heaven. In Christ's humiliation, he descended to the very depths of human woe in sympathy and pity for fallen man, which was represented to Jacob by one end of the ladder resting upon the earth, while the top of the ladder reaching unto heaven represents the divine power of Christ grasping the infinite and thus linking earth to heaven and finite man to the infinite God. Through Christ, the communication is opened between God and man. Angels may pass to and fro from heaven to earth with messages of love to fallen man and to minister unto those who shall be heirs of salvation. It is through Christ alone that the heavenly messengers minister to men. This is a wonderful thing that Christ has done because he was willing to humiliate himself, to go through that suffering, to go through everything that we go through on an even larger scale than we go through. Because he went through all of this, we now have this amazing ability to communicate to the God who created everything. I mean, we think about talking to stars or celebrities and think about how many people get nervous and are starstruck. That is nothing compared to the God of the universe being able to talk to him, being able to tell him everything, being able to thank him and praise him and to connect with him as friend with friend. That just blows my mind how a heavenly God is willing to do that, wants to do that, and loves us so much that he went through all of that just so that we could have this communication with him. And that is so amazing. I mean, you see all of these kings and all of these people and they have security measures and bodyguards and it is really impossible sometimes to meet with them and talk with them. But here God is wanting to talk to us, wanting to communicate to us and to love us and not only do that, but also on our level, which really says something about his character and how much he truly does for us and how much he truly loves us. Just think about that and contemplate it and study this subject out for yourself sometime because it really is an amazing thing. And that is what makes heaven so awesome. That is what makes serving God so amazing is because of the love and the sacrifice and 
what he does for us. That makes it all worthwhile. That makes us want to be with him forever. She continues, Adam and Eve in Eden were placed under most favorable circumstances. It was their privilege to hold communion with God and angels. They were without the condemnation of sin. The light of God and angels was with them and around about them. The author of their existence was their teacher, but they fell beneath the power and temptations of the artful foe. 4,000 years had Satan been at work against the government of God, and he had obtained strength and experience from determined practice. Fallen men had not the advantages of Adam and Eden. They had been separating from God for 4,000 years. The wisdom to understand and power to resist the temptations of Satan had become less and less, until Satan seemed to reign triumphant in the earth. Appetite and passion, the love of the world, and presumptuous sins were the great branches of evil out of which every species of crime, violence, and corruption grew. Satan was defeated in his object to overcome Christ upon the point of appetite. And here in the wilderness, Christ achieved a victory in behalf of the race upon the point of appetite, making it possible for man in all future time in his name overcome the strength of appetite on his own behalf. So we can overcome addictions, overcome appetite, overcome any struggle that we have because Christ defeated Satan. We just need to pray, pray, pray. And we need to fall on our knees and go to God and ask for forgiveness and ask for his help and he will help us. It is not an easy thing to do. Sometimes it is a real struggle and sometimes you may fall, but we must arise again. The righteous man falls seven times, but the unrighteous falls only one. That's because he doesn't get back up and try again. We have to try again and we have to realize Christ, who is our king, has redeemed us and he loves us and he is waiting and willing to do that for all of us. And Lord, I just pray that you do this for all of us here because we are all sinners in need of your saving grace. She continues with this. We have characters to form here. God will test us and prove us by placing us in positions to develop the most enduring strength, purity, and nobility of soul with perfect patience on our part and entire trust in a crucified Savior. We shall meet with reverses, affliction, and severe trials, for these are God's tests. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and purge his people as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. The cross of Christ is all covered with reproach and stigma, yet it is the hope of life and exaltation to man. No one can comprehend the mystery of godliness so long as he is ashamed to bear the cross of Christ. None will be able to discern and appreciate the blessings which Christ has purchased for man at infinite cost to himself unless they are willing to joyfully sacrifice earthly treasures that they may become his followers. Every self-denial and sacrifice made for Christ enriches the giver, and every suffering and reproach endured for his dear name increases the final joy and immortal reward in the kingdom of glory. We have work to do every single day. And every single day we are brought with temptations. And every single day we need to go to the Lord and ask for help. And be willing to go through all of these things for his sake. Because he went through way more for our sake. So with all of this being said, please study this out for yourself. Because this is a really great subject to study out. And it really shows you how much God loves you. And how much he sacrificed for you. And what is waiting for us if we take those steps. If we go to the Lord and... I can't even begin to describe what heaven will be like. We are given descriptions of a little bit, a glimpse of what heaven will be like, but it is nothing that we can even think. We can try, but it will far surpass anything that we could ever think of. And not only that, but we will get to spend all of eternity with no more death, no more separation, no more worrying about evil people destroying us or hurting us or sin ever rising again. That is the kind of world that I want to live in and the kind of world where I get to serve a loving God who loves me and who can teach me the great mysteries of the world and who has my best interests in mind. And I hope that you all want that. So I want to sing this song. It's called Conquerors and Overcomers, Now Are We. 
conquerors and overcomers now are we through the precious blood of christ we victory if the lord be for us we can never fail nothing against his mighty power can ne'er prevail conquerors are we through the blood through the blood god will give us victory through the blood through the blood through the lamb for sinners slain yet who lives and reigns again more than conquerors are we more than conquerors are we in the name of israel's god will onward press overcoming sin and all unrighteousness not to us but unto him the praise shall be for salvation and for blood by victory conquerors are we through the blood through the blood god will give us victory through the blood through the blood through the lamb for sin is slain yet who lives and reigns again more than conquerors are we more than conquerors are we unto him that overcometh shall be given here to eat of hidden man ascend from heaven over yonder he the victor's palm shall bear and a robe of white and golden crown shall wear conquerors are we through the blood through the blood god will give us victory through the blood through the blood through the lamb for sinners slain yet who lives and reigns again more than conquerors are we more than conquerors are we that's actually a new song that i just learned so i felt that it was very appropriate for this podcast it fit in with exactly what we were talking about so you'll have to forgive me if it's not exactly how it is in the hymnal but it was a really nice song and i just want to encourage all of you once again to study this out for yourselves and remember what it says in matthew 5 16 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven so once you know all this stuff go out to the world and let your light shine and share with them the love that christ has for them with that being said, let your light so shine so that you are a star witness for the Lord.